Okay, so uh, let me welcome you again to this uh, outcome-based uh, symposium. And I would like to remind you uh, that the, the theme for our symposium this year, 2022, is non-conventional non teaching and learning activities in engineering education from OBE perspective. Uh, so here we are having our techni technical session number one. Uh, the chair for this session uh, is uh, Dr. Muhammad Fakhrul Islam. Dr. Muhammad Fakhrul Islam. Uh, I hope he's already joined us. Fakhrul, yeah, here we are. Yeah, okay. Uh, so before I hand over to Dr. Uh, Fakhrul Islam, let me just uh, share with you uh, some information about our uh, our chair or the chair for this technical session. So Dr. Fakhrul Islam has received his education in Bangladesh from the University of Dhaka uh, up to the PhD. Currently, he is working at the University Grants Commission of Bangladesh, and he is also the, he is the director of the strategic, strategic Planning and Quality Assurance Division. Uh, he is a regular contributor in the national dailies on the issues of higher education, quality of education and contemporary uh, world and so on. He has received a number of awards and scholarships, including one award from the British Council uh, in 2000. Uh, yeah, and he received also some other rewards from Malaysia, from Netherlands, from Sweden. Yeah, the, the list is really long. Uh, when it comes to his uh, contributions, he authored a number of uh, research papers, peer reviewed papers, and he also has got uh, or authored two books. One of them is Higher Education, uh, Higher Education in Bangladesh, Prospect and Challenges, uh, and the Shakespeare's Impact on Modern Bengali Plays. I'm not sure if this is these are two books or the same book. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it looks like the, the same book. Uh, he has got also another book. The title is in Bengali. Uh, just to make sure that I'm not making mistake there, I will just read the, the, the translation of the title, which is Education Science and, it, and uh, Education Science and Education in Bangladesh. Uh, he has got uh, many links and collaborated with many people all over the world. Uh, including the United States of America, United Kingdom, Malaysia, Singapore, England, uh, Australia, France, Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, Italy, Germany, and so on. So with that, then uh, it's my pleasure now to hand over to Dr. Muhammad Fahrul Islam. So the platform is yours now, Dr. and you can take control of the technical session. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. And very good morning. Uh, I'm very much delighted and you know I'm very much honored. And it's a privilege for me to introduce uh, welcome all of you in this International OB Symposium 2022, organized by Arsenal University of Science and Technology, which is a leading university in Bangladesh. And as you know, we are very much delighted. And it's a great opportunity for me uh, to introduce University Grants Commission as well as our private University of Bangladesh. You'll be happy to know that Arsenal University of Science and Technology is playing a very pivotal role in higher education since its inception. And Private University Act 2010 was promulgated in the parliament and you know, Arsenal University was established uh, before 2010. And the history of private university of Bangladesh started in 1992. Distinguished guest, as you know, outcome-based education uh, is a, a new field in Bangladesh and University Grants Commission as well as Ministry of Education uh, started our journey in 2018. And also University of Science and Technology uh, is uh, playing a pivotal role, especially in outcome-based education and quality assurance Sale of Arsenal University, 
headed by Professor Mazar Islam and Honorable Vice Chancellor. They are doing fantastic work uh, in the last three or four years. So at the moment, I'd like to uh, introduce our honorable speakers. And today, you know, uh, there will be three sessions and our valued participants as well as audience, they'll be immensely benefited uh, through this presentation. And I personally do trust and believe that uh, the outcomes will be delivered by the speakers and the policy issues uh, will be implemented by the University Dance Commission as an Ministry of Education. So at the, at the onset of the program, I'd like to introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Nisar Ahmed. Professor Dr. Nisar Ahmed is the current vice chancellor of Sikhaus University of Peshawar, Pakistan. He's a professor of mechanical engineering, and he did his PhD from Lavra University, UK. Dr. Ahmed is, uh, you know, he's a director of quality enhancement cell, and he's also working as dean of undergraduate students. Prior to joining Sikos University back in 2014, and so far I know it's a private university, leading private university in Pakistan, and established in 1996. Dr. Ahmed served for Taiwan University, Al Madina, Manuara, Saudi Arabia. And for two years, he worked as a you know, professor of Khan Institute, uh, Swapi, Pakistan. Dr. Dr. Ahmed has more than 20 years teaching, experience, teaching and research experience in university and different research organizations. He's a leading researcher in the area of ultrasonically assisted mach machining. And he has 40 publications, and he acquired funding of around 2 million US, USD dollar. He has uh, three, his three papers got the best uh, prestigious award in their province to acquire level two accreditation. And under UV, he delivered uh, different lectures in different seminar workshops, symposia locally, regionally, and globally. And this lecture in the seminar on the implementation on OV has process in different issues. Now, I'd like to request our honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, Sikos University, Peshawar, Pakistan. So honorable Vice Chancellor, he's going to deliver his presentation at the moment. So I'd like to request Dr. Nisar Ahmed to deliver his presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, uh, really, it's an honor to be talking on this prestigious forum. I'd like to share my screen and then uh, I'll give a brief about what I'm going to present. Uh, so this is, um, uh, let, let me first give you a background for this specific presentation. Uh, as I saw in, in, in Professor Richard Felder's uh, presentation, so this too is is a bit uh, is a bit addressing the wider topic. I'll go wide and then I'll narrow down to the to the theme of the conference. So uh, first of all, what what is this presentation about? After COVID, uh, we saw some issues uh, with with our students' uh, uh, interest in, in in the university curriculum and studies, and like the output was really affecting. So we had some brainstorming sessions, one inside the university, and then once in one of the sessions, we invited some of the vice chancellors from universities, and we had this discussion that what is the university of future going to look like? And, and with, with the future, we don't mean like tomorrow or may, maybe the, the, the following decade, but maybe the time, like say in three, four decades. The idea was that if we can highlight some of the the, uh, the, the things that we are gonna have in the future. So we can basically uh, start implementing few things similar to them from now. And what will happen is that eventually when the time come, we will be at least ready to some extent. So let me give you the scenario. OB came to Pakistan, uh, well, I mean, for quite some time, like back, back in 2012 or something, there were some universities working with that. 
but at Seacoast University, where I'm currently the vice chancellor, uh, we uh, started implementing OB back in 2017. In 2019, we became the first uh, uh, private uh, uh, university in our province to uh, be given this OB accreditation from Pakistan General Council under the level two. So they are basically distinguishing level one with respect to level two. So level two is the new OB one. Uh, we started teaching, delivering under that and, and, and the degrees were basically accredited. Then came the COVID. So with the arrival of the COVID, what happened though? So the kids went home. I mean, we went home and we were all, we all started delivering lectures. Like uh, obviously, how are you going to deliver your labs? What about your psychomotor skills? What about your effective domains? Another problem that was uh, basically gaining its, its, its momentum in the background was the widespread usage of social media. So the kids, like to be more there than in your class, like uh, there are things that are happening. And, and uh, okay, one of the things I, I'd like to first clarify, I'm not gonna present any textbook stuff, okay? So I'm going to present you something which is the need of the time, which we as, as policymakers and as vice chancellors of different universities are facing these days. And obviously, as I said, I'm gonna bring it to, the, uh, to some of the strategies we are, what, what I'm going to propose in terms of teaching. So uh, due to this, this social media thing, the kids have become very short tempered, okay? So to them, life is like apps. You don't like one app, delete it, install another one, okay? Uh, apps were still better, then came TikTok. So TikTok is like swipe up. So you don't like anything. You think I'm just gonna swipe up and this trouble is gone from my life. And they want things also to be implemented like this into their life. So this is another thing. Okay, another issue that is happening now is the demand for skills rather than degrees. What is happening here in, 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 in Pakistan, at least what I'm seeing is that everybody is teaching how to sell on Amazon and kids are finding it fascinating rather than how to earn a mechanical or a civil engineering degree. So this is another issue that we have to see and we have to address in time in order to make sure the survival of the universities and then obviously the, the, the very basis of our education system. So what, what are the challenges that we are facing? One of the biggest challenge that we are facing in our class is the focus and interest of the kids. So they are present, but they are not present, okay? So they are sitting there, but they are not really there. So uh, this, is, this is one of the issues that we have been facing that how to make sure that they are taking interest in the content. The other thing that we are facing is the trust in certain technologies. Unfortunately, I mean, like Pakistan is, 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 is a developing country and, 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 and I can see that the similar situation is with, with uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Sri Lanka and some other countries that we tie our desire for a degree to the economic prospects. So we, we are not there really for the interest, but we are really for, for the economic prospects that we see it is gonna bring to me. So some people are now losing interest in certain technologies. And, and when I was looking at, at, at recently a chart which where, where the demand for certain new technologies was proposed. So things like nursing, things like uh, physiotherapy. I mean, like they are now in more demand than some of the technology things. The other thing uh, which happened is the changing market demand. And as I said now, like, I mean, uh, what, what we are looking at globally. So the demand for those kind of jobs is increasing. Also, what we are seeing is the lack of motivation. So the money was his passion and the skills was his degree is, is kind of like really the kids are not really motivated uh, uh, and, and honestly speaking, I mean, we have seen this change quite recently. Uh, back in 2000, I mean, when, when a kid will come to a university, he will be at least interested in grabbing this degree with good grades and he will have some idea of what is he going to do with the degree. But now uh, we are finding it very difficult to motivate the kids to study a certain specific degree. So uh, th this, this whole thing is actually creating some challenges and this is setting the very foundations of, of, of the, the definition of university. So wh why, why is the university there? So then we had some meetings and we had some discussions and we, we talked about the university of the future. So the discussion is, is, is a very open-ended. When the people, when, when, the, when, when the participants came to, uh, to the uh, committee room for these discussions, we told them there is no budget limit. 
there's no time spin, there's no uh, HEC, no PEC gonna stop you from saying anything. Just say it, what you want to be in the university of the future. So let me come to now the conclusion of those discussions that how do we see the certain aspects of, uni of, of the university in the future? So the first is the teacher or the instructor or the faculty member. What are we finding now is that, um, again, I'm telling you, I mean, I'm not gonna come, come with the textbook stuff, okay? So uh, I'm, I'm just telling you something which, is, which we are really facing. A faculty member joining a public sector university, he then go easy that, okay, I have got the position now and nobody can challenge my position. Nobody can move me from the seat. So what happens is that he, he, he goes into this uh, comfort zone where he is only willing to do the jobs which are as per his JD. Okay, so what we see in the university of the future is that foreign instructor will be no contract. Okay, so uh, three, four, five people coming and applying for a certain position, they will basically compete for a slot. And competition means that they have to prove their skills that they do have, they do possess some specific knowledge and that's why they should be given this opportunity. Now, how will their salary be formed? There'll be no fixed salary. So whenever they, they, they get some assignments, some duties in a semester, every uh, task will have a certain credit defined and the collection of those credits will actually be their salary. So suppose an instructor teaching 13 credits will have a, an X amount of salary and then somebody teaching five credits will have um, a, a different salary. Then what about the student? So what kind of students will you have in the future? So what, what, what the, the outcome of the discussion was that there will be just, we will just define minimum education. It should be secondary school, the 12th grade, okay? There'll be no age limit. So there'll be nothing like that you cannot come to the university because you are beyond certain age or something like this. And then they can choose their own instructors. Okay, uh, I, I'm sure like there are, there are um, uh, much better people uh, in, 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 uh, in this uh, conference sitting and listening to me. Um, see, we need to go back to how the universities were formed. There was nothing like a university anywhere. I mean, so what was happening? Three, four kids, five kids, 10 kids, 10 students gathering, and then they're thinking, we need to learn this course. Okay, who's going to teach us? So they'll go and they'll look for a certain instructor, and they'll bring him, and they will agree with a certain amount of money. The guy will teach them for one week or so. If they like the, if they like the person, they will continue. If they don't, I mean, they'll stop. Or this person, the, 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 the knowledge hungry uh, uh, or the, uh, the eager student will actually walk miles and miles from cities to cities, from continents to continents, and then he will join uh, some, some reputable professor. And then, and this is how we saw what happened in the Muslim world, how the evolution, how, how, how it happened. And, and that's how we were leading uh, the world. So what about the curriculum in the university of the future? As I said, I mean, like, uh, um, uh, this is something which is already happening in OBE, the way we form the PEOs. But in the university of the future, the industry demand plus the future trends will define the PEOs. And obviously, those PEOs will form the PLOs, and then they'll trickle down to the CLOs. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coining a new term rather than OBE, there will be SBE, the skills-based education system. So we'll have certain skills defined and then we'll be, and then uh, obtaining a certain set of skills will be a degree. Going to the assessment. So uh, what, 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 what the outcome of the discussion was, that there'll be no assessment. Okay, then how do you know if the student has learned uh, or not? Uh, the, the economic pressure will push the student to learn. And this is where, where you can see the difference between a degree and a tuition. So when a kid joins a skill-based course, like say when, when we see a kid joining an e-commerce course, okay, the instructor don't have to tell him keep quiet or, or, or focus here or anything. The kid knows what he's doing and the kid knows what he, he wants and he is too eager to, because he knows the economic pressure. So the economic pressure will drive learning. And then occasionally there'll be some surveys performed to gauge understanding, but there'll be no assessments in the future. Now, how will the university be governed? 
So we know, I mean, like in our countries, we have this typical structure of uh, uh, the board of governors and, and the academic council and uh, the, the different councils and things. So the, the governance will be decentralized towards the departments. So the department, so mechanical engineering, uh, what's it say, chemical engineering will have, will have the power to, to basically decide uh, some, some, some uh, higher level decisions of their department. There'll be only a base registration fee. There'll be nothing else, no, no fixed defined fee for a degree. Uh, some skill-based degree might require 100 trades and some skill-based degree might require 300 trades. So it will depend upon the skill. Another model that I see can, can, can really work out well in our country, especially the countries like say Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka and some other neighboring countries is the rent out source model. Suppose, let me put it like this, that for example, in Dhaka, there are four universities and every university from their typical, from their routine councils are required to establish a mechanical engineering lab, a civil engineering lab to a certain standard. What happens is that you spend, everybody spends some amount on these. So how about this? Let's suppose an X university develop a very reputable mechanical engineering facility, but the other university work solely on the civil engineering and some other university work uh, to develop a very cutting edge uh, electrical engineering lab facility. And then they are open to share these resources with the students of other universities. So this way their money will be well spent. Rather than board of governors, I'm saying the board of innovators. So these are the people who, who, who know where, where things should be and they will be there to help us. And rather than having these uh, deans and uh, registrars and all those positions, I'm just introducing some coordinators. So there is going to be a manager IT, a manager finance, a manager HR, and a manager academics and manager media. What should be the physical dimension of this university of future? So the university of future has no boundaries. Education is happening inside the class and outside the class. And we should really look for the new developments like the meta campus. So technologies like VR and AR, so we should have the labs in virtual reality. And then we should also think about the new modes of learning, which includes the synchronous and the asynchronous, the synchronous where live lectures perform and the asynchronous where you record your lectures, put it somewhere. And we have already seen Coursera and edX and some other top-notch platforms working on the asynchronous model. So then, okay, now, now I'm coming to, to the real topic. So I, 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 I gave you the problem, I gave you the challenges, I gave you a kind of like a glimpse into the future, but now let's talk about uh, what teaching and learning strategies I'm proposing to uh, uh, align our targets with, with what is uh, expected from us. So first, obviously, student-centered. I know OB also claim to be, and some, some, some other models out there, they are saying it should be student-centered, but this one is, is, is the, the university of the future is basically, we need to be student-centered because it's not us who are teaching, but it's rather they. And, and I really like one of the examples given by Professor Richard Felder that for a successful completion of a buying and selling process, there should be a buyer and there should be a seller and somebody should have bought to make sure that somebody sold. So going there and teaching and just thinking that, okay, somebody has received it as well. So this is not something that, uh, okay. The other thing is the placement. One of the new curriculum in, in Pakistan, uh, which, which is not yet adopted, but now they are enforcing uh, the one-year placement for all the programs, let it be uh, um, uh, science or arts or any program, that one year of the degree should be spent in the um, uh, industry. So what I'm saying is that uh, the three plus one and the two plus two model, and even why not, like even this model has, uh, I have seen it evolving, that some of the industry is establishing the on-campus specific degree programs. So they are really working on that, what, 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 Professor, or what uh, uh, Professor Richard Felder said, the hands-on. So take the students right to the industry and let them spend some time there. Uh, things, effective usage of project-based learning, the problem-based learning, and the inquiry-based learning. Now let me talk about them a little bit. I know uh, many of us know, but there are many youngsters joining as well. 
So the project-based learning is a, is a teaching strategy where at the beginning of the semester, you actually give a small project. And then as the semester progresses and you are teaching your course, but they are working on the project and they, and they get a glimpse of an idea of like where they can uh, basically apply the knowledge gain in the subject. Problem-based learning, so in, 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 in one of your class in, in a week, maybe you can pick one of the class, you can write a problem on the, on the whiteboard and then you can become a kind of facilitator or a moderator like be, to become part of the audience and then you all can and, uh, combinedly try to solve the problem. Inquiry-based learning, uh, and, and I'll give you an example. Uh, when, whenever I teach this uh, topic welding, I always draw two sheets of metal on the board and I ask the students, how can we join them? So they start giving all those crazy ideas. So we can glue them, we can push some nuts and bolts, we can weld them, we can uh, just tie them together. So what is happening is that, that they are now trying to understand, uh, they, are, they, are, they are opening up to, to, the, to the process of learning. And when we see them actively involving, then we can like throw in some of the ideas. So somebody saying, okay, we can use bolts and nuts, we can always say, yes, this is the temporary fasting method. And then somebody saying we can like do the welding. And so that's how you, you kind of like bring them on board first and then you start teaching. Another thing which I think uh, um, uh, Malaysia has done it and, and this was also proposed in, in the discussion of the University of the Future is the pre-categorization of institutions. You see, every government has a certain budget and it cannot give it to every university. So a certain uh, part, if, if divided among 100, everybody will receive less, but if you divide it among five or six, they will receive some considerable amount and then a certain research can be done. So the university should be pre-categorized uh, into teaching institutions versus the research institutions. The teaching institutions focusing more on the teaching and then the research institutions focusing more on the research. Another thing that we have seen is that the problem-led departments, which, what we are calling the precision education. So the precision education is that, suppose if you can form um, a university, a, a department, which is only working on say cancer research, and then you have, you have students studying there, but specifically they are studying on one topic and that is related to the cancer research. Uh, the, the, the thing that we need to understand and what we have seen during COVID as well, but we are proposing is that self-paced. So the, the education in the future will be self-paced. Every kid is different. Everyone has some unique features. Everyone has something as in, in, in terms of his strengths and weaknesses. So uh, the, the, we, we need to make our education system self-paced. And this will happen because of all those synchronous and asynchronous uh, modes. Now, another one is really important, emphasizing on learning how to learn. This is important. And I think one of the uh, PLO in, uh, implemented under OB, they are asking for um, lifelong learning. See, we cannot teach everything in the class. And, and, and let me talk here about the principal difference between certain uh, publishers and Atan. I hope I, 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 there won't be any copyright issues. Uh, when, when we look at the two publishers, I'm just quoting them for the sake of examples. So McGraw Hill versus John Wiley. The books of McGraw Hill are kind of like, uh, they, they, they make it so easy. They put everything for you in the book. And, and, and this was the case when we were studying. So we were using some of the books by the Indian authors and they will put everything in that book. Every single piece of uh, confusion that might arise, it will be in the same book. So you don't feel the need to go to the library or to go to the internet or to sit there and to study anything. But the thing with John Wiley, uh, what, what we have seen and, 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 and we usually were using their books is because they will, put something, but they won't put everything. So they will let you go and inquire. So I think what we need to do is we need to put our kids on the track of learning how to learn and make them good lifelong learners because things are changing rapidly. And, and the advancement is happening in, 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 in a way that things happening in 10 years, a similar magnitude of things will happen then in one year. So it's, it's kind of like, the, the, the next duration of happening a similar magnitude is 10% of, of, of in the time that it happened previously. One of the other thing that, that I put here and I liked it when Professor Richard Felter also put it, 
facilitation of students towards independent learning, giving them skills like communication skills, analytical skills, critical thinking, and IT literacy. Just give them these skills and the kid is self-sufficient. I mean, he can adopt to any new uh, demand and requirement that might arise that he might face. Uh, also, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to see some of the topics later in, in, in the workshop about this gamification. You see, you have to understand that if you want to uh, really deliver your message to a certain community, what you do is you talk to them in their language. So when, when, when uh, uh, a certain guy is coming to suppose Pakistan, uh, the, the US president once came and he was quoting uh, from the poetry of Allama Iqbal, our national poet. I mean, he don't know Allama Iqbal, but obviously he picks something because this is something that we're, what we know. So you have to talk to the community in the language that they understand or the people or the references that they know. So the, 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 the new um, millennials or whatever you want to call them, I, I think now they are, they are even far beyond them. They, they, they know games, they know these virtual games and, and this is where they want to live. Now with the, with the arrival of metaverses, so uh, I mean, they want to live their, their whole life in them. And still we are so reluctant to even talk about them, we kind of like consider them as taboo terms, like who games and like virtue, and especially when we talk about say those cryptos and tokens, it's like uh, like considered bad terms. But this is something that 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 they are using and they are learning. So going to VR and AR, I mean having a virtual campus, going towards uh, simulators. Uh, uh, again, I'll tell you what happened in 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 uh, during this COVID break. Uh, we we moved to online, but the biggest challenge is was how do you take your labs online? Okay, so we we made some videos and we did something, but what about having those uh, VR uh, simulators for your labs? The beauty is you're not really worried with if the kid increase the pressure to a certain extent and what if the compressor blasts? No, there is no 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 blast going to happen because this is a simulator, and then. We cannot beat the, the level of uh, visualization that the kid is going to have in this virtual world. So uh, converting an air conditioner into a heater or really looking at how the compression is happening inside this chamber, the VRs can do it much better than, 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 than the real world can do it. So, uh, and the idea of Maker's Lab. Now, um, I think at some stage, uh, King Fahd University of Premier Minerals was basically establishing this lab. And uh, we are also thinking of establishing one of this lab that anybody in the community can come up with the model and he can send us the model and basically we can uh, uh, help 3D print it for him or her and let him uh, help him with visualizing it. So make us the concept of makers labs. Now, uh, in terms of teaching and learning strategies, another topic is uh, team teaching. So rather than having, uh, and, and uh, I'll, I'll quote one example here, Dr. Mazar, you must be remem remembering this, that in our first capstone design project, what we did was we picked up one project and give it to the whole team. So it was this electric car. Now what was happening is that the kids will go, so somebody got the suspension, somebody got the body, somebody got the solar system, somebody got the batteries, but every kid is now facing a kind of similar set of problems the design problem, the, the heating issues, the, the cooling issues, the, the different, the costing and everything. So this kind of projects, and, and honestly speaking, I mean, Dr. Mohamed Umar is here, so that was his brainchild and, and really, we really appreciate what we learned during this process. So uh, team teaching, uh, multiple teachers coming, and I see this, this phenomena in UK, in their modules, when they offer a module, they bring in experts from different fields and one module is shared between five or six people and everyone is obviously expert in his failure. And then the, the, the subcategory is the cross subject projects. And, and the example that I quoted from, from Taiba University, the electric car, this is one of the examples that, that you pick up a project which is addressing. One of the similar idea that we picked in, in, in our university sometime back in 2016, I think, we said that, okay, students, students always say we are in burden. So we are, we are really busy and I don't know what they're busy with, but this is the typical complaint you will get. I mean, you guys have kept us very busy. So what we did that we requested that say, suppose we are talking about the students of fifth semester. 
So we requested the, the, the four or five instructors, those who are teaching them, to come up with one project for all of your groups. So uh, a student uh, would say studying manufacturing processes and then also taught thermodynamics in the same semester. So one project that he is, is teaching, learning something about it in the manufacturing and then learning something in the thermodynamics. So at least he will have the precious time save for whatever he's going to do with. But also he can be um, uh, really learning about this uh, cross subject integration. Another thing which is in the need of the time and we are talking about is the interdisciplinary projects. Um, having projects where there is contribution from electrical engineering, computer science, management science, mechanical engineering are much better than the student just doing some simulation project in his department. So this is another thing that can really enhance um, the, the, the attention. Um, what we are now seeing is that uh, entrepreneurship is, is really needed. And we have failed to basically produce entrepreneurs. So I'm, 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 I'm putting this, this, this thing that project to product. We do the project, okay, we, we, we get our outcome. We are, are rather it's us who say that the product is not needed, but it's not the, rather the process that you should know that how did you perform this project. But honestly speaking, now the times are changing. We should be focusing on the project to product. So the, whatever project he's doing, uh, he or she is doing as um, their final year project, they should be able to take it as a product and basically roll it in the industry. And this will improve uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, for this, more recently at, at our university, we have introduced an incentive-based system for our faculty that if, if, if uh, the one of the FYP working under them it, it results in an entrepreneurship project or basically is, is, is kind of like a startup, so we pay them a certain incentive. And the idea was to, to make them keen towards this. So not only we pay to the faculty member, but even we pay a certain amount to the HOD because he's the lead person. He's the leader who brought this. Um, capstone design project, very amazing stuff in that. And honestly, when we brought this uh, uh, FYP under the OBE, we missed some good parts of that. One of the biggest aspect of the capstone design project was the presence of the customer. Oh, Customer-oriented problem solving, we should really focus on that. And I, I remember that, that even though at Taiba University, we did not have much resources by then, but we were still having this virtual customer. So one of the, us will, will basically act as a customer. And then there will be regular meetings with the customer. The customer will attend some of the occasional meetings of the, of the final year project. And then he or she will pose his queries and questions. And I think, I think about it. So there are many things that can result. So customer give uh, a demand for a project in his or her language, which is a layman language, but then this need to be transformed into the technical language. Once transformed, then the students need to work on it. And then occasionally they need to meet with the customer. So we, we, we produce very good engineers, but honestly speaking, when they come to the market, they, they know nothing about the costing. They know nothing about how to write it in a particular report. These are some of the real challenges. Now, in, in the academia, uh, when, when I said like the challenge is from, from the people who are from the skill oriented things, people are looking for skills. So we need to be like, and, and this is what we did in our computer science department that we will teach you the core curricula, but along with that, we can introduce some non-credit courses as skill-based courses. I mean, you cannot teach Amazon as a course. Okay, you cannot teach e-commerce as a course, but you can teach some of the, like say business and say some of the platforms and the dynamics of, of international businesses and stuff. But Amazon can be put as a, as a non-credit skill-based course in the evening. Some other courses can be put like that. And for that, you don't even have to dedicate your faculty. You can bring your societies into action. As me, ASHRAE, AIAA, all those societies, so they can basically offer your student chapters at your universities. Obviously, as me, America is not going to offer it for you, but your student chapters can help you offer these. Now, um, obviously, uh, there's huge advancement coming, and and AI. I mean, like uh, there, there is an advanced AI in our computers and our phones and everywhere. We need to have like this era of hackable human beings. So creating 
AI-based algorithms to basically understand the aptitude of a kid before he or she enters the university. What do we do? We, 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 we look at the, their, their 12th grade marks and then we give them another exam similar to that as entrance exam. And then whoever is the, is the best in rote memorization, he's the winner. So I, I think it's, it's much more than that. And I remember in, in, in Russia, they follow a similar model that till the 12th grade, there's nothing like medical engineer or there's no pre-engineering pre-medical. They all study the same stuff. But after their 12th grade, then there is an assessment by, by like using some aptitude test. So the university decide for them which field you are best suited for. And then they send them to mathematics or to engineering and to some other areas. Uh -huh. So the career path selection, okay. Is there anything? Uh, excuse me, uh, honorable professor. May I request you to finish your presentation? Yes, this is the five, last slide. Okay, five minutes more, okay? This is the last slide. Yeah, thank you very much. No worries. So uh, then, uh, uh, so we, what we are proposing is that the university should have a common first year. Even like when they come to the university, there should be nothing like he belongs to double E or to civil or to mechanical or to some other area. And then once they finish the first year, some AI-based career planning should be performed. Uh, some problem-based domain should be allocated to them. And then the electives will be planned as per their uh, uh, plans and, and, and activities what they plan for. Let me conclude my, my presentation and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one of the uh, most important factor which I think as UGC and Dr. Mazar being part of the OBE should understand. What is happening with us? So OBE came to us, we were asked to implement, we did good job with documentation, okay? And then we, we, we got you an accredited. But do my faculty really understand the essence of it? Do they really know what they are doing? We have actually made them busy with so much documentation and paperwork that we need to really look at, is the faculty really gaining the actual benefit of OBE? So, to know the outcomes and then to adjust things. But when you look realistically, and I told you, I'm not gonna give you any textbook stuff. I'm going to talk realistic stuff. When you look realistically in every department, you will find one, two people who have really understood what it is, but you will see 100% people coming back to you with all the documentation completed, okay? So the second point is we need to understand the socioeconomic demand and then adjust our system according to that. We need to emphasize on learning how to learn and we should be the university, not our kids. We should be really the early adopters of technological advancement and we should really surprise them with our know-how of technology rather than they surprising us with their know-how of technology. So thank you very much. I'm sorry, this is something, but uh, there are many things that I, I really wanted to share because we face these things daily. So thank you very much. I can't hear you, sir. Professor. Professor, uh, pro yeah. thank you very much indeed, Professor and Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Nisa Ahmed. Uh, you have discussed different issues, and all the issues are very much vibrant and viable at the moment. And you know, uh, the future of the university and skill based education, all things are very much correlated. And you have uh, discussed on uh, program learning outcomes program education outcomes, PLOs, CLOs, and also mapping. And what the things you have discussed also, you know, entrepreneurship, and you have discussed on analytical, critical, uh, interdisciplinary skill, which are very needed for the country development, as well as, you know, global development. And you have discussed also, you know, some project simulation and how to implement the projects. So things are not ending, you know, this is rather beginning. And in Bangladesh, you know, we are going to implement outcome-based education or result-oriented education, or what we can say skill-based education. So th this is the journey we have started. So there are some questions from participants. So there will be a session for five minutes based on question answer. So can you hear me? Yeah, 
we can hear you, Dr. Fokru. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'd like to request to honorable uh, presenter and vice chancellor. So could you please uh, give the answer of the questions? Uh, do, do I have to read them? I mean, that's, okay, let me, let me look at them. So, yeah, let me help, uh, Dr. Nasir. There is one question from Sayed yes, Sia. Yes, Sayed Zia, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. So there is one question from Sayed Zia. Skill-based learning is the need of time, but the industry do not extend much support and encourage students at their premises. How, how to deal with the issue of cooperation of industry with academia? Yeah. Actually, uh, Dr. Maza, first of all, you have to understand that the industry itself is changing. So the industry that we were thinking as our prime source of employment is no more our prime source of employment. The primary sources of employment are now changing and they are more, uh, uh, I think I can, uh, can you hear me still? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, okay. yeah. I can, I can see your screen, so I was just thinking maybe you lost me. So okay, uh, what what we have been doing with 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 the industry is uh, it's 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 with everywhere. Okay, so they say they 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 use lots of words. They come here. Even the government introduced some incentives to them that will give you a five percent tax deduction if you kind of like bring in the kids to your campus and 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 involve them. What we really need to push our students is that when when the students go to the industry for their internship. So obviously one, A, the industry is not doing much, but B, the student also is not pushing anyone. And I'll give you one of the example. When you go to the industry, the engineer is not gonna give you time. It's rather the supervisor that you have to offer him some tea and some, some, some goodies and some benefits that he's gonna give you some good knowledge. So I think you need to, uh, in terms of internship and say, if you want to learn something, what we recently are doing, we are bringing actually the model of Taiba University when where, where you we 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 made our internship project uh, we, we make it different first a the logbook b the, the the report c the regular attendance and assessment and d now we are also saying that you should be solving one of the problem of the industry at their site for your internship to be acceptable as uh, like 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 for for passing your grades so now you push the student. Now he is eager. He is pushing somebody there. So this is one thing. The other thing, because of this government incentive, so now the industry is giving us scholarships, uh, sorry, uh, not just the internships, but they are giving this stipend and accommodation with that as well. But what we have seen with the industry, uh, the private, the, okay, let, let's first talk about them as separate two entities. One is the private sector, one is the public sector. The private sector, the state mentality, really, he is more into the money thing. He is not, he don't even trust your skills and capabilities. So how you can engage him by inviting him on regular basis to your university, engaging him regularly and build that trust. Honestly speaking, most of the industry have either once or twice knocked at your doors, but they are not being entertained well or the, the product that they have got was not of that quality. So they have to go to those imports and other issues. The, the second is the public sector. So the public sector is offering you lots of incentives and things, but again, you have to do some, some like, like push your students when they go to the site, they have to learn something. I'm sorry, it's, it's not really uh, the, the, the best answer, but uh, let me, uh, how would instructor achieve student learning? Do, uh, Dr. Mazar, can you help me with getting yeah. a couple of questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, there's very important question from one participant, though the uh, participant is uh, anonymous attendee. How much load will increase on the teachers uh, following the outcome of education two times or three times of the present system? Yeah. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is a typical question that, that, that the faculty asks. Actually, uh, first, okay, how can you convince your faculty first to adopt it? Uh, Dr. Mazar knows it, and, and, and it's a very uh, popular concept in the US that basically whatever credits they are teaching, so suppose they are spending 40 hours on campus, so you translate those 40 hours to a certain number of credits. So teaching credits is one, two, three, and lab credits is one, two, two, whatever formula you follow. So first you show them that, okay, for this subject, you are asking me, say it's a three-credit course, but you are asking me nine hours per week. 
within nine hours, what are you really doing? It is a burden initially. So, and, 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 and I, I really respect the concept of Taiba University that whenever the course was offered first time, they were giving us even like say, if the course was three credits, they were giving us four credits. That okay, because this course is developed for the first time. And 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 um, uh, doctor, sorry, I I I I'm I'm, I'm really uh, yeah, Fakhr Islam. This is yeah. for you. This is important for you because you are the policy maker. Okay, so you need to really help them here. Okay, and the help is that when a course. Uh, that, yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to inform you that, you know, uh, University Grants Commission and Ministry of Education has promulgated the one of office order that is, you know, uh, office memorandum to all the universities. And we have, you know, uh, uh, decided how much teaching load should be for one teacher and how many uh, sessions or how many classes he has to take in one week or only, you know, each semester. Okay. So this is, this is finalized from UGC part. So I'd like to give the answer to the honorable teacher who has asked the question. So if you visit UG's website, you will get the information about teaching load. Okay, let me let me finish my answer. That yes, initially at the time of implementation, OBE has some extra burden and load because of all this yeah. documentation. But later on, things become so nice, so good that you know what you're teaching and you are enjoying what you're teaching. So this is, and by the way, the problem with our teachers in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and those places is they think that the job of a faculty member is teaching. No, the faculty stands on basically teaching, research, and then the, the community service. There are certain principles for that. So I think you, you need to tell them this again and again, that you are a faculty member, not, not a school teacher. So then, then they will be happy to basically cooperate with you. Yeah. Okay, so I'll take only one question more. How to protect copying of assignments, even if an individual task given to each student of the class, it may, it may have evaluation deviation. What to do? Yeah, uh, uh, this is the last question. The, the, there, is, there are certain ways, like obviously one of the way is, is what we do is like, uh, obviously uh, uh, the, the turn it in that you can look into it, but I don't really, uh, uh, like it because and and when you give unique assignments what happens is that uh, you, you have a lot of burden and load to to check it yourself so i would say um, that still uh, uh, in, in in our university in in in, in gik institute what we did was we used one model and that was the assignment session so if i give an exercise to the student as assignment i don't check it once they come back I give one of the question out of that assignment as a quiz. So I just check their learning rather than checking uh, 60, 70 assignments. And I think Dr. Mazar already knows about this assignment session thing. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Honorable Vice Chancellor. So uh, from my part, you know, that this is really uh, helpful for us. And you will take all the suggestions that you have provided us, we'll implement. So uh, thank you very much once again. So thank you we are much. going thank to start a, a second session on aligning capstone project selection and outcome assessment by Professor Mohammed Umar, Taib University KSA. So you are going to start our second presentation. So before going to start a second presentation, I'd like to introduce our honorable uh, speaker today before the audience. Uh, Professor Muhammad Umar received his bachelor and master's in, of science in mechanical engineering from Cairo University, Egypt. Uh, he obtained his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois in Chicago in 2003. Dr. Omar is specialized in the area of multi-body system, dynamics, vibration, and mesh, uh, machine design. After receiving his PhD, 
Dr. Umar accepted the position of senior engineer in the Machine Research Center of Caterpillar, Illinois, USA. After four years, Dr. Umar uh, started to be his career in engineering specialist and then selected as a subject matters expert for machine research. In 2009, Dr. Umar moved to academia and joined Taib University, where he developed a particular interest in engineering education, outcome-based education, and accreditation. Dr. Umar served as a member and chair of many committees related to curriculum and quality assurance in the university and colleges. He also served as the chairman of the mechanical engineering department and vice dean of development and quality. During his service, Dr. Umar worked on developing the study plans in the colleges of engineering programs and the transition to outcome-based education as well. He also designed and implemented the quality assurance system in the colleges of engineering and the academic programs. Recently, the College of Engineering programs received full accreditation from AVET. And that is about Professor Dr. Mahmoud Umar. So I'd like to request him to uh, start his session right now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm very thankful to Dr. Mazar for this invitation. Um, I also thank him for um, presenting this uh, very nice symposium and arranging. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Omar, could you please increase the volume? Sure. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, uh, so um, actually my uh, presentation was supposed to be uh, about aligning the capstone project selection and outcome assessment. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about this and uh, I'm also I'm going to share our experience uh, from moving uh, to the outcome-based education uh, in Taiba University. Um, so uh, I would like to share my screen. Okay, so actually uh, um, we started our new program while uh, Dr. Mazar and Dr. Nasir uh, were in Taiba University and they had uh, significant contributions to our programs. Um, and after they left, we started uh, uh, converting into outcome-based education um, with the hope that we can get accreditation from national uh, accreditation system, what we call it NCAA. And after that, uh, they informed us that we can move to um, international accreditation from ABIT. So based on this, we had uh, significant changes in uh, uh, our curriculum. And I would like to share uh, most of what uh, we did in our in our uh, transformation from um, regular uh, educational program into uh, an outcome-based education. Um, I would like first to share some of the um, uh, fundamentals that we have learned uh, from um, some of the uh, scholars in this area. Um, Basically, from Dr. Steady, I quoted from his uh, uh, lectures and his uh, literatures. Uh, he basically defined the outcome based education as an a paradigm, a system that has a paradigm that can form and shape our decision, decision making patterns, and um, the way we can uh, take an, the action that will affect our teaching and learning. Um, according to Dr. Spady, also he um, would like to propose two uh, purposes for the educational system that all students must be equipped with knowledge, competences, and the qualities needed for successful uh, for their success after they exit the education system. And also they need to have a structured operating programs that can maintain those outcomes. Um, 
maybe our uh, presentation will be a little bit away from what Dr. Nusir presented. Uh, he's talking about a uh, completely different uh, space from what we're going to talk. We're talking mainly about our traditional system that is built on uh, the market needs in, uh, in our country. And we'll talk about, about this a little bit. Uh, also, Dr. Spady talks about um, premises that all students can learn and succeed, but um, they can learn in a different ways and on different times. And this is what they defined as um, the student aptitude that is can he can learn, but he needs to have time and maybe he can have different ways of learning. Um, also, he needs to have he defined the second premises as successful learning promotes um, more successful learning. And actually, we said that we in our schools, we set the conditions, we define the conditions, and we uh, construct the conditions for successful learning. Uh, there is also principles uh, that we put for the outcome-based education. Uh, the, um, uh, first principle is that we have should have clarity and the focus. We need to have expanded opportunities rather than have uh, time boxes uh, system that we have. We should have high expectations from our students. We should not put them down, and we should also um, work on a design down uh, curriculum structure for our our students. Uh, he has uh, defined five practices. And they, um, they can be summarized as uh, time methods, modalities, and modules, operational principles, and performance standards. Basically, I'm presenting this because when we work it with um, the outcome-based education alignment, it is not we, uh, as simple as we take an existing program and we say you are going to convert this program into an outcome-based education. When we work on outcome-based education, actually it's, it requires a lot of work um, for uh, employing this design. Um, so basically we have to work from the ground zero and build our system up. And basically we start by identifying the vision of the directions of the country where the country is moving. Uh, if you look at uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, five years or seven years from now, it's completely different from what is happening right now. In seven years, um, there was no design, no analysis. Most of the companies rely on external sources. But right now, um, and maybe five years back, they started to shift this uh, industrial system. Um, basically, we have um, headquarters for companies. They require design. They need students to have uh, full competence of engineering. And whatever we had as um, uh, as implied needs at the beginning of our program, those have changed right now. The industry has uh, new trends. They are requiring skills, as uh, Dr. Fraser mentioned, Dr. Nasir mentioned the soft skills, the hard skills. And based on those, uh, actually, the paradigm for um, the employment and the rules of engineers in the industry right now, they change it. I can tell you most of the five, seven years from now, most of our students will go and work as managers and headcounts. But right now, our students were, um, will Will, will go and work as real designers. They can work on the maintenance. They can work on uh, the planning, the analysis. All of those functionalities, they would require us to define what would be the future rule of our graduates in our program. And based on those, we define our program educational objectives. The program educational objectives actually define what would be, what would the student be able to do after five years from, um, from their uh, education. Also, we need to look at uh, the student interest, what they are interested in. Dr. Nusir mentioned um, the entrepreneurship and the change in the um, media. And basically, this changes the scope of the student uh, vision for the engineering employment. But for certain other, certain other countries, employability and mobility, also are very important for, for our students. 
And based on those, uh, we should uh, we work on defining what are the skills and attitudes the students must have in order to have and by the end of their uh, experience. And for this, we have uh, come up with uh, aligning uh, what we call it the golden uh, golden triangle. What do we teach? How to teach it? And then how to assess our our outcomes? So for the outcome alignment, we should look at those uh, three categories. And based on Bloom's taxonomy, uh, we should define our criterion for the standards. Um, we should have high expectations from the students in order to come up with their um, outcomes. Uh, we should establish the prerequisite and teach the prerequisite. If the students need requiring, uh, for example, fluid mechanics, then they have to go for the prerequisite courses. And then we have um, aligned with the uh, teaching requirements. We should align our um, assessment, formative assessments, and we should have um, the assistance for those students who have uh, needs and who should have expanded opportunities. So if we go back and define or look what is the essence of outcomes, the outcome is defined as the culminating experience that has uh, the culminating demonstration of learning. So this is according to 1967 or uh, 78 definition. The outcome is um, a culminating demonstration of the learning. So if we do look at this definition, it has an action that happened after the end of the need and it has to last for the future. This action needs to be tangible, competence, and it requires competence driven by actions and also it happens over, over time. Uh, associated with those actions, we have a performance context that really uh, define what is the students is going to perform. And this action has to last after graduation. This is going to affect the performance of the students. Um, so when we say um, outcome-based education, we have to define what is expected as outcome and what is based? Actually, we mean when we say based is mean the um, the education is defined by, focused on, designed around, and organized for this outcome to achieve achieve those outcomes. And when we look at the alignment, what alignment means or implies that we have the action verbs and outcomes defined in the learning experiences. They are explicitly defined and as words, and those uh, words or outcomes have to be taught by the teacher and must make sure that they are um, explicitly instructed by the teacher. And we must, the student must demonstrate that they have attained those, those words. And uh, the assessment must be directly um, measuring those words that we specifically define and this must be um, defined in the transcripts and documented by our user. So this, in order to come up with a, a, so a overall system, we have to come up with um, a system that can um, report the, what would be the outcomes. And those outcomes has to be taught and we must make sure that the faculty member teaches them. So we have a reporting system we built the reporting system. Also, the, we built the assessment methods for those courses and we aligned with those, the assessment method of the program outcomes. Um, so going back to the capstone alignment, uh, as we think about the capstone alignment is basically uh, as defined by ABIT, they define the capstone as culminating major engineering design that incorporates engineering standards and multiple constraints. Mm -hmm. And this uh, culminating experience must be based on the knowledge that students uh, acquired in earlier courses. So if we focus on those culminating experience, which means basically all what the students have learned can be implemented in, this, uh, in those courses. And also we um, look at the engineering standards which should be included in our, uh, in, our, in our teaching and teach the students how to work with those, those strains. 
Okay, so from our experience, in order to do this um, alignment, we have to work with all the courses that we feed back into this uh, capstone project. So we had to go back on to look at um, the what will really build our program. So we have the National uh, Center of Accreditation and uh, Assessment. Basically, they define the paradigm for our uh, our teaching. We really have to um, look at. Uh, we have to follow the instructions of those systems. Also, our institution is responsible for implementing um, the accreditation system. We need to uh, build our system based on the national qualification framework for um, the degree requirements. And we should also look at the job qualification definition for our program. So if we have different programs, the um, national qualification program, they define for each um, job description, they, have, they need to have certain requirements. So those were part of um, what we did and the formal part. But also we look at the skills and the competence that the employers need. For we had uh, conducted several uh, employer surveys. We have talked to our uh, alumni and our graduates in order to acquire what will need, be needed as a skill to be built in our, in our programs. Also, we looked at the professional body requirements. Basically, we have the um, Saudi, Saudi engineering requirements. There now they require uh, certain um, professional accreditation from the students. And also, we look at the accreditation body's requirements in order to satisfy those during this, this alignment process. So in general, uh, all of those inputs will feed in our uh, the program objectives in order to come up with the program outcomes. And um, mostly of those um, would work in order to achieve the student outcomes as per the national vision and the institutional objectives. Okay. So for, uh, from the mechanical engineering point of view, we come up with a set of engineering educational objectives for our students. And basically those will um, run around the, um, applying the students, the, the students' um, uh, learning and critical skills into um, changing the community around them, uh, helping the uh, profession, achieving the profession, and uh, having the um, long life learning either um, student self-development or through higher, higher education. Also, we come up with a set of uh, outcomes based on those uh, set of engineering uh, objectives. We come up with our uh, outcomes. And those outcomes also had to change it later on when EBIT uh, changes their outcomes, so we had to adapt with EBIT. But, um, Two of the outcomes we added, ABIT had seven student outcomes. We added two outcomes that we then we thought were um, very important for the national requirements. And those outcomes basically are uh, computer modeling and simulation. We found the need that the students should be able to uh, excel in the computer modeling and simulation and implementing based on the um, the trends that we found in the industry, implementing the virtual product developments in, in, and embedding them into our system was a very important uh, criteria that we had to take into consideration during this uh, alignment. So two, uh, those two uh, fundamental processes were important for us. Uh, embedding the computer modeling and simulation inside our courses and the labs and also embedding the uh, compute, the virtual product development in the capstone design project. So also for the capstone, when we focused on the capstone, we tried to implement the capstone in a way that it would serve our um, students' need. Um, and basically we considered, in Taipei University, we considered the um, capstone as an opportunity to prepare the students for the industry. So we worked on a little bit more on the capstone definition and the layout of the capstone, the activities the student that has to go through. And basically uh, working from the outcomes backward 
what should the student should be doing and how do we assess the student the student learning um, basically this uh, helped us aligning the capstone to be um, a culminating experience for the students the student learning so the capstone uh, for us is considered as um, basically an opportunity for the student to work and um, simulate the industrial experience the students actually um, uh, implement what he's going to do in a design process and, um, and, and basically work in all the steps of the capstone uh, or the real, real life real life project. Uh, so there is um, some activities, some, some for us there was some objectives that we have to do. The students has uh, to uh, exercise how he is going to formulate an ill-conditioned problem into a design engineering problem. And for this, basically, he will understand, try to understand the um, requirement from uh, the client and then try to reformulate it in uh, very well defined engineering um, statements. Also, we should use the systematic approach for open uh, ended engine to solve an open ended engineering problem. The students also is gained to use his engineering judgment and assessment. He is going to experience. Uh, working and managing teams effectively. Uh, also, the students should be work on project planning and the management. Um, the students should communicate effectively, and we should build this skill and emphasize on the, how the students is doing this. And also, the students in cooperate in his project. He should incorporate economic, social, and constraints in his project. The students also should integrate um, what we gained as engineering knowledge in the core classes that we had before. And also based on those objectives, we divided our uh, or derived our, um, our student outcomes. Uh, those student outcomes are uh, very well uh, organized and aligned with the outcomes or the objectives of the course. And also they are aligned with some of the program outcomes. So we can utilize them in assessing the program outcomes or the student outcomes on the program level, not only on the, on the course level. So for the virtual product development was one of the key issues that we mandate the students uh, to use in their projects. And this actually um, go back to two things. Number one, if we implement the modeling and simulation uh, in our courses and labs, this will give the students a very large opportunity to explore the problems in engineering. Uh, also, this will allow us to give the students more resources that they can uh, learn outside of the course. Uh, so we build our the modeling and simulation during the courses incrementally. We started first by the uh, courses that have uh, computer literacy, uh, and then we built um, the student ability to um, model simple systems in introduction uh, to engineering design courses. And then we built the student ability to programming uh, through a MATLAB course dedicated for uh, mechanical engineering students. And this course actually uh, was designed specifically to teach programming, not for the sake of programming in the sense of programming science or computer science. We use the um, MATLAB programming as a way to teach the students how to implement a solution to engineering problems that we might, might face. Traditionally, um, the uh, C and C++ are used for teaching programming, but we found that this is not going to be very helpful for our students in terms of um, basically, they are not very practical to build a program. Uh, sometimes you will need to visualize the output. Sometimes you need to have interaction. Uh, sometimes you need to have complicated systems. So we found that uh, MATLAB programming is a very good environment. The student can very early learn how to program very early, how to build a simple program, how to create a code, how to create his results, and at the same time visualize his outputs using MATLAB um, as one of the alternatives for teaching the programming, we found it very effective, uh, very, very effective for us. 
And also we found that MATLAB can be used for um, advancing the student uh, modeling capabilities. For example, MATLAB has a semiscape uh, and that has, um, uh, it, it has uh, semiscapes that has, uh, can be connected to uh, other uh, toolboxes in MATLAB. Semiscape itself allows the student to model physical system without understanding too much about the physics. But we direct the students to model those systems such that he can experience interactive system, he can uh, inter work with multidisciplinary team. So we can have mechanical engineering students work with uh, electrical engineering students, or we can have interdisciplinary teams. We can have students who have focus on um, thermal systems with working with the students who have uh, focus on mechatronic system, students who have focus on um, solid mechanic system. So they can work as teams that are focused on specific areas, or they can work as integrated teams from mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. And this is actually, we found that um, for us, our, our students, it's very important to prepare them for uh, the workplace. So we can have the multidisciplinary teams and the interdisciplinary teams are very required uh, tasks from, um, from the employers. So for uh, the VPT, virtual product development, basically it's a combination of um, tools and computer-aided softwares in addition to processes and uh, procedures that are used in the industry uh, to implement the analysis and the design in um, the workplace. So we decided that we can uh, start by teaching the students how to use the virtual product tools individually in the different courses. And then uh, we move them at the end of the program. Uh, so in the capstone project, they can combine those virtual product development into their capstone project. So basically the students will learn how to program so we can do the analysis, we can do the simulations in different programs. And then at the end, combine those in, in solving these problems in, uh, in the capstone. So basically uh, the uh, VBD processes, they can, the students allow the students to generate CAD models, they can uh, use them to simulate uh, simulation software to simulate uh, real life environments. They can experiment with the simulation results and compare it to physical results. They can optimize their design to meet the client needs. And the most important thing for the, for the PBD, they open the opportunity for the students to explore their own designs. They can investigate their own problems. They can go beyond what we teach them. They can also allow us to give them the open-ended problems. They can go and explore by, them, by themselves. Also, um, the um, VPD tools that we have uh, allowed us actually during the pandemic to use, um, replace the actual physical labs by um, software-based labs. We can, uh, since we can model uh, multi-physical systems using those softwares, we replace those software, those, those physical labs by experiments that, that we send to the students so we can explore and experiment with them at home. So in general, um, the implementation of the VBD um, for our system can benefit the students by acquainting them with industrial um, industrial tools that they will, are going to use in, um, in the companies after they finish. Uh, they can reduce the number of the design iterations. They can also allow the students to perform more design analyses and to compare, conduct com com comprehensive design experiments. Also, they can perform, um, they can form a rich platform for cooperation between the students, especially when we use uh, multi-team projects uh, or projects that can span multi-teams. Multi we can teach the students how to integrate together their work. And this is very good um, opportunity for them to be prepared for, for the industry. Also uh, using the virtual product development allows the students to have deeper understanding by experimenting with the different, different um, 
different uh, different parameters and different conditions. Okay, so I'm going to skip this a little bit because we don't have too much time for this. Okay. So as uh, Dr. Nasir mentioned, uh, we have the Capstone project basically come in three modes, uh, the problem-based projects, which is basically the, um, the students will be have a situation and they are going to have a problem for um, starting from the starting point and go to super, their supervisor or the coordinator to facilitate this project. And the second uh, is the problem-based projects. And the third is actually the design-based design project. For us, we consider only the, uh, the uh, project-based problem and the design-based problem as our, um, our categories for our capstone. Uh, the capstone uh, will go for us, uh, will go through stages. Uh, first stage is basically to have the problem identified or the proposal for, for, for solicited from the faculty member. And then um, we select those uh, problems in a way that they are going to perform or meet our, meet our criteria. Uh, for the students, the students will uh, have a problem identified either by the proposal or they have to come up with the problem and they are trying to solve. And then they are going to formulate uh, those requirements into a real, real design, design problem. And then they will come up with uh, solution alternatives. After the solution alternatives, they are going to um, do exhaustive search in order to identify what can be uh, used. And then they analyze those uh, alternatives uh, based on the design specifications that they have. They can uh, design, you can design and select which alternative can be a viable solution. And then they will perform a detailed analysis for this solution that they choose. After this, they perform a detailed design for the selected solution. Once they complete those the detailed design, all of those designs and all those steps must be performed in a virtual product development system. And at this stage, the students would require will be required to provide us with the virtual. Uh, with the virtual models that we have. At this stage, actually, we are um, reaching a very good level in comparing, comparing to the industry. The industry now, before they come and uh, produce any product, the product has to be validated virtually. And now the, the industry, they have the concept that we call it uh, virtual twin. The virtual twin is actually the um, model, the digital model that we have for our product. So at this stage, before the student to go to our prototyping, we require them to have a virtual twin for their product. After we make sure that this virtual twin is acceptable, um, we go through prototyping so they can start uh, selecting the standard components, they can uh, go and for market research and select which component will be purchased, which components will be um, manufactured. And then uh, they start manufacturing and assembly. After that, they go for testing and evaluation. So this, is, this can be done and actually this can be accelerated um, significantly by using the virtual product development team. And this is allows us to uh, force the students to go through all the uh, steps of the product design uh, using those virtual product uh, development tools within a small period of time. So we can implement the capstone uh, within two, two semesters. Based on those um, course and stages, the students will have to go through a lot of, um, um, a lot of, um, deliverables, so they have to provide, um, they have to provide the literature review, they have to do Q QFDs, they have to do Gantt chart. Um, doing those activities prepares the students with the management skills that the industry needs for the project, project management. Um, one very important, um, one very important um, uh, note that we have here 
uh, according to what the definition that we just said before, the students, the, the, the capstone is a culminating experience. Um, some of the topics that the, or some of the activities the students are doing have not been taught before. And for this reason, uh, some of the, those topics have to be taught during the course. So the course actually has part of the course is based on lecturing to teach the students how to conduct some of the uh, skills. And then um, part of the course will be the implementation of their own, their, their own project. Okay. So how do we come up with, how do we select our, our uh, projects? Basically we have, um, we have several sources for our projects. Faculty member that produces uh, project proposals. This is most of the universities and most of our um, courses are surely going by this. Um, we also uh, solicit, um, we solicit problems from the industry, which is uh, quite difficult. We have research partners for the projects. We also can ask the students to seek um, problems from the real life and the try to come up with uh, solutions for them. So this will teach the students by themselves to go and identify problems and try to find out if they can uh, propose a solution for those. Also, we are um, looking at uh, solar uh, car competitions. We have uh, projects, three projects for the solar car uh, competitions. Also, we are uh, looking at the Baja competition from uh, international, international, uh, international organizations. So basically, those are the major uh, capstone sources that we use for our, uh, our students. The, um, for, in order to ensure our capstone projects fulfill the criteria that we need for our, um, for our projects in order to fulfill the accreditation projects, According to the accreditation, actually, the students must be working with complex problems, complex engineering problems. And the definition of the complex engineering problems are well defined. So we need to make sure that the whatever proposal um, is submitted for the uh, capstone is actually fulfilling those criteria. So for this, we develop uh, templates. So we have a template for the proposal the faculty member should fill, fill out or the client should fill out and then it will be revised by faculty member or the students themselves if they identified if they identified a problem, engineering the problem they can have, we ask them to fill out this proposal and to consult with faculty member to fill it out with them. And after having this template uh, we have an assessment, we have a committee that will assess those um, proposals based on rubric. So the rubric will identify how uh, this proposal will fit with our definition of capstone. And if this is going to have enough learning, with enough learning for the students, if this is actually, uh, this proposal can um, be considered um, enough work for a capstone project or just uh, can be in the level of uh, course, course project or something like this. And then we have a set of rubrics for the student assessment. So during the work of the student, uh, the, the, during the work of the deliverables, uh, those are assessed using rubrics. And those rubrics are uh, well established. Right now we can think they are uh, well established. They are aligned with the outcomes and they are defined by um, the um, faculty member and they are defined by the committee. We teach the uh, faculty member how to use them and also we give them to the students. We give the students those rubrics so they can understand how they are going to be assessed and what are the expected levels for them in order to achieve certain, certain grades. So here we have, uh, this is an example for um, uh, the template that we use for um, the pro project proposal. Uh, and then uh, this would be assessed by the proposal assessment, assessment rubric. Um, some of the proposals would not be fitting with our, uh, with our criteria for the capstone project. And those would need to be revised. 
by the faculty members. So we have an advice for them how to how to uh, put them in a um, uh, form that will be qualifying uh, the students or the, the criteria to be submitted to the students. So when we assess our um, when we assess our project, uh, basically we look at um, those outcomes. We use those rubrics, and we align those outcomes with um, we align those assessment with uh, what we defined as the program, the, the course, the course outcomes. Um, also, those uh, assessments will have to be delivered uh, to the students, explained to them during the course course orientation. So, for example, this is and uh, those are rubrics that we use for the student's presentation. Um, basically, during um, the presentation, the students are expected to um, present their formulation, and we define to the students what will be the levels expected from them, and what will be the grades that they are expected to achieve after each one of those um, of those projects. And as you can see in this template, actually we defined um, the program outcome that this uh, is going. This uh, assessment is going to be used to support. And what would be the course outcome that this assessment is going to use? And what would be the criteria that we are using using for this assessment? And the level of achievement that the students must must achieve in order to get certain specific grades. Those are uh, combined uh, together in order to give us an indicator for the course outcome assessment and for the uh, program outcome achievements. So the, sum, summarize the activities that we have. Um, we have the courses implemented over uh, two semesters. In the first semester, the student is expected to have a project proposal associated with a project presentation. So whatever the students is going to um, achieve during this course, they are expected to have um, some kind of approval for their proposal. This approval can be either from the client or from a committee of experts in the field in, um, in the course. And the students also is expected to maintain a logbook and the portfolio, which is checked monthly by the course coordinator. The students is expected to um, develop a Gantt chart for his project, so he can follow up with his activities and follow up with his progress. The students is expected to develop a set of design criteria and design specification, and also he should perform quality uh, function deployment in order to, during his work. Um, the students all during the first semester will have a report and presentation, and this will conclude his uh, first, first semester. Whenever the student passes in the first semester, then he will go to the second semester. In the second semester, he should be working on um, completing his design and provide us with his virtual, uh, virtual model completed. And all the analysis should be also documented using uh, the modeling and simulation tools. Uh, he should conduct a presentation, a progress presentation, where the committee and the examiners uh, also can give them feedback how to improve or how to progress. Uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Umar. Yes. Uh, may I request you to finish your presentation within five, five minutes? Sure. Okay. sure. Thank you very much. And also at the end of the uh, second semester, the students should present their prototype. We also have, um, we have rubrics to, for uh, the final report and rubrics for the uh, assessment of their, the, student, the student design. So um, just to conclude our, uh, our work here, uh, we are, um, when we work for the alignment uh, of the, for the OBE, uh, we must have a fundamental change for our, our program. We don't expect that we can just fill out some template uh, that is going to fulfill uh, the accreditation requirements. It's actually a lot of hard work that will be required from the administration of the program in order to bring out this as this um, concept into the, um, the, 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 the into life. 
And also, as Dr. Nasrid said, uh, it's very important that those are not going to be only a documentation. If it is going to be a documentation, then it's just a waste of time and a waste of paper. You can just hire a spare that to do it for you. But more important, in order to have a real life, in order to have impact on the graduates, in order to have impact on the engineering life, the faculty member must be well trained on how to conduct actual, um, actual outcome-based education. And this is what we can say, this is the hardest part of the outcome-based education system implementation is how to get faculty members involved in doing the outcome-based education. Um, in order to come up with a good, solid outcome-based education, the um, outcomes has to be specifically stated for the program. And then this has to be uh, dismantled to the courses. What are you going to do? Which courses are going to support which outcomes? The outcomes has to be supported by the topics that will be taught. As Dr. Fuller said, you uh, focus on what the students must know and what is good to know. We should identify them and to make sure that the instructor is teaching those topics. Those outcomes must be assessed and the student must know that he is going to be assessed on those outcomes. And those outcomes must be documented for the future. What we found that uh, in order to fulfill the um, needs of the industry, bringing up the virtual product development uh, into the and including it into our program is very vital and very critical to prepare the students, uh, especially for using the digital tools, using the computer, using what Dr. Nasir said. Um, we can prepare the students even to be entrepreneurs by just teaching the virtual product development. Well, since we started uh, embedding those uh, virtual product development tools and modeling and simulation tools inside our program, we see some of the students are hired only because of their um, um, ability to use those virtual product tools. Industry are looking for students who have uh, those tools. Um, embedding the virtual product development need to be planned and need to be incremental. We are not saying we have to uh, come up with a virtual product development from the beginning, but it is uh, incremental inside inside the curriculum. Uh, it's we don't um, usually the uh, is uh, very uh, sensitive about the virtual product development tool, but what we can say. Uh, for every commercial software that we have in the market, there is an open source. And the students can, if they can uh, do something in MATLAB, they can use it with GNU product, they can use it with other products. So we don't have to stick with um, only the commercial products, we can also use the open sources, but um, it trains the students and teaches them how to use those products in order to benefit them in, uh, in their current education and also in the employability when they go back to the market. Okay, thank you very much. This is uh, what I have what I have for today. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud Umar, for your fantastic presentation. Uh, and here is the end of our second presentation or aligning capstan project selection and outcome assessment. And so far, I you know understand from his presentation that is really praiseworthy, and the different issues he has uh, covered, which are very much related to the paradigm, sh paradigm shifting in design making. And he also mentioned some soft skills and hard skills of uh, engineering education. And the program education ob objectives, which are really uh, needed for curriculum development and also teaching and learning. And he has mentioned employability, mobility, and versatility of uh, engineering education. And he has also projected a very fantastic uh, triangle that is golden triangle that is about what to teach, how to teach, and how to assess our learning outcomes. So he has covered all the issues of knowledge domain. And if you uh, think about the issues of Delors Commission by UNESCO, uh, there are four pillars you know, of learning. That is learning to know, 
learning to do, learning to uh, learning to be, and learning to live together. So, for a quality graduate, a graduate must uh, ensure this sort of quality. And you know, in Bangladesh, we are working on uh, blended education as well as national qualification framework. And Bangladesh government, special university grants commission, and Bangladesh accreditation council uh, approved. Bangladesh National Qualification Framework, that is level seven to level 10 in 2021. And we are now working on it. And Professor uh, Mahmoud Umar mentioned some, you know, uh, he has given some of the suggestions or recommendations for better teaching and learning, including in engineering education. And he aligned some fundamentals uh, models, simulations and BPW, which are really needed for the engineering education. And if we can implement this three issue, our new engineering graduates, uh, they will be able to uh, focus on uh, the engineering issues, especially in practical, uh, in practical field. And Dr. Mahmoud Umar, he covers us in a Bloom's taxonomy uh, that are very much in interconnected with our OV. So once, Thank you very much, Dr. Mom Omar. And we are now going to take some questions uh, from the participants. So, uh, Dr. Fukru, there, uh, Dr. El Sheikh has raised his hand. So, if you kindly give him a chance. Uh, please, uh, Dr. El Sheikh. Assalamu uh, <clears throat> alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Omar, for the presentation. Now, my question is very simple. I just wanted to know the size of the, the group. I think you, you do the capstone project in groups, right? Yes. So how many students uh, are in each group? Okay, um, we started by restricting the size of the team to three. This was a typical size that we use for the team. Uh, according to EBIT, uh, they allow, they, the EBIT define the team to be two or more students. So the team can have two or more. Uh, we think uh, my personal, from my personal experience, I think team of three is the optimum, optimum size. Uh, four is okay, but five definitely will generate problem. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Okay, there is one question from the attendees, uh, Shoaib Muhammad Sharia. Okay, I'm promoting him to in the panel so that he can uh, ask his uh, question directly. Um, Mr. Shweb Shahriar um, can uh, ask his question on the panel because this is a webinar. It's a webinar. Uh, they cannot just answer from from that side, from attendees side. So I have already promoted him. Um, I'm wondering if he's there or not. Yeah, you can you can ask your question, uh, Mr. Shweb Muhammad Shariar. Shariar, whether he's available or not. Okay, I don't know. It's better. I mean, I I would request the attendees to type their questions or post it in the Q and A. Yeah, that's that's better. Then we can address that directly. Okay. So uh, there is just one request that please share all the presenters' email. Inshallah, we'll do that. Inshallah, we'll do that later on. Uh, Mr. Shoaib Muhammad Shariar, I tried to promote him as the panel, as one of the panelists, but it looks like uh, it's difficult to do that. Okay, we are running out of time. I think we should. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad Umar. Thank you very much. Uh, stay blessed. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Uh, now we are going to uh, start our uh, last presentation. Uh, this presentation would be delivered by a uh, director of Institute of Quality Assurance Cell of Arsenal University of Science and Technology, Professor Dr. Majar Islam. So before going to uh, start our session, I'd like to introduce our beloved and very respected presenter today. And all of you are very much aware about Dr. Islam. Dr. Majar Islam is currently acting as the director of IQC. Arsenal University of Science and Technology, Bangladesh, since January 2020. He obtained a Bachelor of Engineering from India in 1993. He worked at Bangladesh Power Development Board, which is the uh, largest board in Bangladesh, for about nine years 
and during this that period he completed two masters in science degree one in mechanical engineering from bangladesh in 1998 and another one in renewable energy from germany in 2001 in 2003 he started his doctoral studies and subsequently received his phd in mechanical engineering in canada uh, professor islam taught engineering courses in bangladesh canada saudi arabia and malaysia and some other reputed university all over the world and dr islam is very much uh, involved uh, in different activities especially outcome based education uh, training sessions conducted by university grants commission and bangladesh accreditation council and he uh, delivered his presentation frequently on different issues especially quality assurance and engineering education so i am now going to request our honorable uh, presenter today director of iqc Austin Institute of Science and Technology, Professor Dr. Major Islam. Dr. Islam, could you please start your presentation? Thank you very much for your kind words, Dr. Fokrul. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Yeah, you can hear me? Can you hear me? It's very vibrant, very clear. Okay, excellent. Okay, I would like to share my uh, screen now. Let me share my. Okay, I think you can sh see my um, slides as well. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu wa Salamu ala Rasulillah, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa ala nabiyana Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, now... The title of my presentation is Bob's Model for Effective Class Sessions for the Undergraduate Engineering Students. Now this, um, I think most of the engineering faculties, unless they have attended ISW institution, um, instructional uh, skills workshop, this is, should be something new, yeah, Bob's Model. I will explain that inshallah. So in the beginning, I, I would like to explain the Bob's model. Then I'll try to focus on the six elements of the Bob, Bob's model. Then I would refer to six common planning errors, which I found in Professor Felder's teaching STEM book, awesome book. I think all the engineering faculties should have. So I will focus on those six common pla planning errors before moving to how, how to implement Bob's model in your own class sessions. So I'll do that. And at the end, I'll draw some concluding remarks in short. Okay, what's the Bob's model? There are many models, but this is one of the models which is available there where you have six components. So when you are delivering a presentation or conducting a class sessions, you can have these six elements which are there in the Bob's model. So you start with a bridge in slide, I will explain inshallah. Then after that, you should have your objective or outcomes. Then you do a pre-assessment followed by participatory learning. Actually, the focus of this symposium is lying here, participatory learning, but you cannot just jump there right away in the class session. You should prepare the ground, right? So that's why we have some earlier stages. And after the participatory learning, you move to post-assessment and finally summary. So these are the six components of the Bob's model. So the Bob's model is one of the critical elements of the instructional skills workshop, ISW. The acronym is ISW is quite popular in Canada and in some of the countries 
and it was originally developed in Canada. And ISW has been facilitated in different parts of the world, yeah, in so many countries. Now, people have, now I can suggest something, but it should be supported by rigorous research. And I was surprised to see that people have conducted uh, quite serious research activities with ISW. Even there was a doctoral study by Matt Person uh, in and the dissertation came out in the year 2011. So he conducted a detail, I mean, a serious, rigorous study related to ISW. I mean, uh, and I would like to share some of the research findings in his research, in his dissertation, he wrote, Macpherson wrote, the experience of these ISW participants was uniformly energizing and has had a positive impact on their teaching. How they see themselves as teachers and how they think about their students' current and future learning. So this is from the research part. And also he found the results of this research point to the ISW encouraging transformative change. I repeat, transformative change in teaching practices and that this change has been manifest in a number of ways by the participants. So from his research, this thing was found. And also there was a research project in Canada, I think in Ryerson uh, by Deborah Dawson and McIntyre. And their report came out in the year 2014. So they mentioned that more than 100 institutions worldwide have offered the instructional skills workshop ISW over the last 30 years to develop more student-centered reflective instructors. Professor Nassim mentioned about this student-centered thing and that is very much there in OBE. So this ISW workshop really helped. And also they found, this Deborah et al, they found that in the qualitative analysis, ISW participants frequently describe replacing part of their lectures with a variety of active learning methods. This is related to our, this symposium, active learning methods, reducing the instructional focus on content transmission. Now these are related to ISW in general. And I would like to reiterate that BOPS is one of the critical elements of this ISW. And they also found that ISW appears to offer a fairly low cost opportunity to enhance teaching skills of college and university faculty. Now they also found something related to BOPS as well, Deborah Dawson and McIntyre, that participants reported that after taking the workshop, they were better at managing time when preparing for class and during class time itself by applying the BOPS structure. So they found from the, their research that it was beneficial based on rigorous research again. And also they commented, again, this is a research finding concerning BOPS. They commented that students reacted positively as they became more familiar with the model and found that teachers' expectations were clearer. So this is, uh, I think this should encourage all of you to take Bob seriously, okay? So regarding my personal reflections about ISW and Bob Salmon, alhamdulillah, I had the privilege to attend Bob's, uh, this ISW workshop in the year 2014 at University of Calgary, Canada. So I, I, as I attended, I had to deliver three mini lessons only based on Bob's and obtain valuable feedback from the participants also from the instructors. So that was quite beneficial. I benefited immensely from, from, this, uh, from this ISW workshop. And I, my teaching career, I think I had transformative change basically after attending this ISW workshop. Then 
currently I'm implement, I have taken BOPS really seriously. Currently I'm using BOPS um, using uh, LaTeX Beamer. I use LaTeX uh, Beamer to prepare my slides and to implement BOPS in my class sessions. And inshallah, I'll try to show you some of the examples. Now we move to the six components of BOPS. One by one, I would like to go through them. First, starting with the bridging. Bridging, what is bridging? So bridging is basically begins the learning cycle, gains learner attention, builds motivation, and explains why the lesson is important. So even before you start the presentation in the, or in the, in the class session, even if, if you, even before you start the contents, you have your bridging slide. And usually today you saw my bridging slide, there was a word cloud, yeah. Word cloud basically. So you can have different types of things in, in your bridging slides. It can be codes, word clouds, like my presentation here, images, audios, videos, it's up to you just to draw the attention of the learners. So it's a good positive thing. Next component is objective or outcome. Now in the ISW manual and some of, I have seen some participants, some institutions they're sharing the manual and you will find detailed discussions about objectives and outcomes and it's up to you. So what is this? This part of BOPS, it, it, it can be either objectives or outcomes, clarifies and specifies the learning intention, clarifies what the learner should know, think, value, or do by the end of the lesson, under what conditions and how well. Okay. It's, I have taken this from the ISW manual. So now we know, I mean, according to William Spaddy, Dr. Omar was referring to William Spaddy. He's uh, quite renowned, one of the gurus in OBE. According to him, outcome, when you say outcome, it, it means culminating demonstration of learning. Culminating demonstration of learning. It happen, It can happen at different levels, yeah? So personally, you can, in, in your box, when you're implementing it, you can either use objective or outcome. Actually, when we say objectives, Usually it's written from the instructor's perspective, from their angle. And outcome is more from the learner's side. Yeah. So personally, I prefer to use outcomes in my slides rather than objectives, but you can do it as well. And if you want to know more, you can refer to ISW manual, which one you should use. Now, this is the big picture about learning outcomes. Learning outcomes, of course, the top you have Okay, PEO and then our graduate attributes, then program level learning outcomes. Then there is another subset, course outcomes. And inside your course outcomes, you have individual lesson objectives. So each lesson, for each lesson, you should have some objectives or outcomes, which are connected, which should be connected or related to course outcomes or your program level learning outcomes or graduate attributes, so they're interconnected. So these class session learning objectives or outcomes, they're very important by the way, very important, yeah? Now, just to give a brief comment about Dr. Nassim mentioned that we can do OB-based accreditation, yeah? Based on documentation, we might get accredited, but at the end, the issue is whether the students are learning or not and that is happening in your class sessions that is happening in the class session today professor felder showed an excellent quote from john dewey right john dewey and he was comparing this with uh, buying and selling right buying and selling so this is something i mean we should reflect i mean we are claiming that we are teaching but are they really learning this is one important thing we should ask ourselves. Yeah, so that's happening in the class sessions, by the way. So that's why we should take it very seriously. Yeah. And of course, when you are writing outcomes, you should avoid certain verbs like know, appreciate, 
learn, understand. These are forbidden four, according to Felder and Brent. I don't, there are a few others like gain and appreciation for, have an awareness of, perceive, become familiar with. These are some of the verbs which you cannot measure. So you, we should avoid these, these verbs when we are, we are writing outcomes. Next component of Bob's is pre-assessment. So before you, before you start your main teaching and learning activities, you should have this pre-assessment activity prescribed in Bob's model. So answers the question, the pre-assessment answers the question, what does the learner already know about the subject of the lesson? Allow learners to express their needs for review or clarification. Help the instructor adjust the lesson for depth and pace to better fit a particular group of learners. So this is very important. Yeah. Should not, it should not be just, I mean, one size fits all kind of thing. Yeah, from batch to batch, from year to year, your content or your the way you are delivering lectures might vary based on your learners. So how to understand that if you should have your pre-assessment sessions in every class. In every class, you should have pre-assessment. So what are the examples? It can be, I mean, the ISW manual has strongly recommended open-ended questions. So you start the class with an open, with open-ended questions. That will trigger some discussions, it can be high level discussions, high, higher order discussions, or it can be face-to-face -face brainstorming, a minute paper or online word cloud poll. I'm using Slido by the way. I'm using Slido and you can also try that, it's quite beneficial. Also, you can have online open text available in Slido, online game-based quiz, and you can use a popular platform like Kahoot and more. And there are many more. You can be innovative and you can use your own thing, I mean, and have a pre-assessment activity. Then participatory learning. This is really uh, directly related to our symposium, main teaching and learning activities. And this is the body of the lesson where learners are involved as actively in the learning process as possible. So again, over and over again, we are coming to this thing, active learning. There is an intentional sequence of activities or learning events that will help the learner achieve the spe specified objective or desired outcome. So that is basically about this participatory learning. And we'll have to think about this thing, constructive alignment proposed by John Biggs, but it was indicated in other individuals like Tyler, long time ago. So where we are aligning our learning outcomes with teaching and learning activities and assessment. So in the class, when you are delivering your teaching and learning activities, you should refer to the learning outcomes of the course itself and also the learning outcomes which you are defining for your that particular class session. So they should align. So constructive alignment should be very much there in, in, in your class sessions as well. You should, it should be back of your mind and you should think about these three things, KSA, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And when we talk about constructive alignment, this, this is the model based on, um, on the psychology of constructivism. So knowledge is constructed through the activities of the learner. So learner should act if he or she is passive in your class sessions, how they will learn, how they will learn. So that's why you should have some sort of active learning, should not be passive learning. And you know about this KSA, knowledge, skills, and attitude. And in order to have construct, con constructive alignment, we should have, I mean, we are using Bloom's taxonomies. Uh, three domains of Bloom's taxonomies are used for uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. The cognitive domain is related to knowledge. Psychomotor domain is related to skills. And affective domain is related to attitudes. These are known to, I think, all the 
engineering faculties uh, nowadays. Now, what are the teaching and learning activities you should have under your participatory learning? Should be active learning. And Felder and Brent in their uh, this highly acclaimed uh, textbook, this uh, teaching STEM, this is awesome thing. I mean, everybody, I think all the STEM faculties should have this book. Yeah, this is a must. And you have lots of tips and suggestions and based on sound research, rigorous research. So there are different types of active learning which we should promote in our class sessions. And in this symposium, inshallah, in the other presentations, you will find some of those active learning strategies or teaching and learning activities. And also non-technological alternatives to lectures, you will find it in um, an excellent book available freely from Pardue's website, Teaching uh, Engineering by Wankat and Oryovic. This is also available. I mean, this is, they have one chapter. I mean, you, they have resources available related to this non-technological alternatives to lecture. Also, you should have some sort of brainstorming or think pair share. It's quite useful. I have used it myself. It's quite useful. Think pair share. Case study, inshallah, Professor Royce will be talking about it. Case study and group discussion and other things. Javed Kittu tomorrow will be talking about flipped classroom. So you can look into that aspect as well in your, in your participatory learning strategies. The fifth component of BOPS is post-assessment. So, okay, you have delivered your content. So how do you know that they have learned, they have benefited? from your teaching and learning activities. So you should have a component in your class session called post-assessment. What is post-assessment? Formally or informally demonstrates if the learner has indeed learned and is linked directly with the objective or outcome. So again, you refer to the objective or outcome of that particular class session and you should have some sort of thing, some sort of mechanism to draw that, to assess that, assess the learners. How can you do that? Again, you can have face-to-face -face brainstorming or minute paper, online word cloud poll, online open text, online game-based quiz and other stuff. And there are so many strategies which you can have. The main issue is you want to see whether they have learned or not. The last component in Bob's is summary. Summary, at the end, you want to summarize what, what you have intended to teach in the class. So provides an opportunity for the learners to reflect briefly and integrate the learning during the closing of the learning cycle. So that's the last component of So these are the six components which I tried to discuss. Now, I, inshallah, I'll discuss how to implement BOPS in your class session. But before I do that, I want to draw your kind attention to the six common planning errors. Yeah, it's happening. I found it again from the book of Professor Felder that uh, teaching and learning STEM. I found it from there and it's really quite beneficial. I think all the STEM faculties, they should, they should be aware of these six common planning errors. The first one is trying to cover too much content. Trying to cover too much content. Second one, overestimating what students know and can do. Third one is filling most class sessions with Bloom level one content. Uh, students can only memorize and repeat the memorization thing. Yeah. The lowest level in the cognitive domain. Putting theory and derivations before applications and providing insufficient examples. Showing long procedures without focusing on the reasoning behind difficult steps. And finally, failing to include enough questions and activities in class sessions. So these are the six common planning errors, which we should, all of us, we should try to avoid. And Bob's model can be used to address this. Now, after knowing the six components, if you don't know them already, you can see we can address some of those things in the Bob's model with the help of the Bob's model. So, yeah. 
So just to very quickly tell you the solutions, actually those are suggested by uh, Professor Felder in his textbook as well. The first one, trying to cover too much content. Yeah, consequence, what happens? Instructors have to race over, race to cover everything. The students have few opportunities for practice and feedback in class. So it doesn't become participatory. Suggestion, link content tightly to learning objectives. Focusing, again, today you heard it from Professor Felder, need to know material, need to know materials. You should focus on need to know materials and minimizing nice to know material. You heard it from his own, I mean, his mouth today, in the morning. So this is what you should be doing. So when you are designing your class session under the participatory learning, you focus on need to know materials. And you can minimize nice to know material by preparing handouts and give it to them. Share it, share the nice to know materials with them with the help of your LMS or handout. Then overestimating what students know and can do. So course content, so consequence, course con content assessments are too advanced and qualified students do poorly or drop the class. So that's why your pre-assessment will help you. In the beginning of the class, you do the pre-assessment and see what they know. And then you tailor your class sessions accordingly. Yeah. So Professor um, uh, Felder and Brent, I mean, in the textbook, they have suggested give an early test on course prerequisite. Prerequisites are very important. So in the beginning of the course, you can take some tests and see uh, what you what they know already and that will help you in the beginning of your class session again pre-assessment prescribed in the Bob's model will help you to understand what the students really know before you deliver your teaching and learning activities third planning error filling most class sessions with bloom level one content students can only memorize and review so this is not at all i mean prescribed not at all prescribed we should focus on higher order things yeah, so, so consequence will be students acquire few high level skills. Today, Dr. Nasir was talking about that a lot. Skills, skills, and skills. So how they will learn, I mean, they will develop high level skills if you fill your class with low, lower level things. So students acquire few high level skills and little deep conceptual understanding. So solution prescribed by Felder and Brandt, give students with handouts, with material, you want them to memorize and focus class time on higher level objectives. I think uh, very few faculty members do this in engineering education, but we, we, we should focus on higher level things, higher level objectives in our class sessions. Planning error number four, putting theory and derivations before applications and providing insufficient examples. Again, consequence will be most students can't relate the material to their prior knowledge, needs, and interests and do poorly on tests. Sug suggestion from Felder and Brand: provide examples and applications for every important concept and method, introduce applications before theory. Planning error number five, showing less procedures without focusing on the reasoning behind difficult steps. Again, everything looks logical in class, but students can't carry out sim similar procedures on their own. What will be the solution? Suggestion from Felder and Brand: make complex procedures the subject of in-class activities or omit them if they don't directly address learning objectives. So in the class, if you think, yes, those complex, complex procedures are really important for developing skills, then you should take them seriously in, in your class sessions. And if you think if they're not related to the learning objectives, then you can skip according to Felder and Brett. The last one is feeling, failing to include enough questions and activities in class sessions. So this is what should be there under participatory learning. Every now and then we should have this uh, Q&A. It should fill out through, I mean, throughout the class session, every now and then. So students get insufficient practice and feedback and the instructor can't 
tell why they need help. So build good questions and activities into every session plan. So he's talking about session plan. So now you know the six uh, common planning errors and you should think them critically and then you should implement your, address them in your class session, try to avoid that. So how to implement Bob's in your class session? First, I would request, I would request all of you to critically study the ISW manual, especially the Bob's model. You'll find it between pages 19 to 32, critical study that to understand what are the six components of Bob's critically. So after having that, you prepare class sessions based on Bob's model for the intended class sessions, avoiding the six common planning errors and, and more. There, there might be other errors as well. You try to avoid them, especially the six and design lecture, uh, lecture slides for class sessions in structured manner considering the six components of box. And then finally conduct the class sessions based on the detail, detailed session plans. So session plans are very critical for implementing Bob's model. So here you can see just one template, but if you go to ISW manual, you will find the three other types as well. Personally, I prefer this one, but there are other types as well. You'll find it in the ISW manual between pages 35 to 42, inshallah. And just to show you a uh, few things, I mean, um, as exemplars, yeah, I just want to show you um, some session plans. So this is, uh, I was teaching in, in Malaysia, this uh, one of the thermofluid courses. I, I prepared this for a 110 minute long um, class session. And you can see, You'll, um, I prepared for, I mean, I tried to address the six components of this um, box, yeah? Pre-assessment, participatory learning, post-assessment, summary, all this. And then I also, this is another one. Yeah, another one where you can see bridging, learning objective, pre-assessment, participatory learning, post-assessment. And for each one, you should, I mean, it should be planned based on timing, how much duration basically, how much time it will take to cover that component of box. You should, you should have that. Yeah. So this is a good practice, what I think the faculties they should adopt. Yeah. Now, just to show you some of the slides, particularly these uh, slides from my aerodynamics class. So this is my bridging slide, which you can see they're seeing a figure which is there in the in this class session. And then, okay, it's title slide. I usually do this. I have this, I try to give them an overview of the whole thing, what the whole syllabus and how today's class session is related to other, other class sessions. I try to focus on that. Then you can see these slides are prepared with LaTeX Beamer. On the left-hand side, you have this menu. So as I'm moving, they will be able to see where I, where I am. So right now you can see it's highlighted learning outcomes. So in the beginning of the class, they know what they're supposed to um, gain or what are the learning outcomes, what they're supposed to demonstrate after, the, after this class session. So these are mentioned nicely. Then brainstorming session. This is my pre-assessment. So I have brainstorming session. And here you can see, uh, you can do it with the help of Slido. And, and yeah, what you have learned from the last class session, you can see, and then this is something new, how to design an ear for it. So there is kind of brainstorming uh, with the help of Slido. So I, when I do this, I know what they already know about the design of an airfoil. Then I tailor my lecture according. So then I talk about airfoil design and all these things. Yeah, I can have hands-on session. I, I'm using, XFLR5, so I can have hands-on session. Then after having the uh, participatory activities, I can have reflection. Again, with the help of Slido, I can do this. And then I can, yeah, reflections can be taken with the help of Slido again. So here, write one concept thing, idea, which is not clear from today's class session. You can take that reflections from the students. And finally, you can summarize what they, they have learned from this class session. This is just one example, but, um, you can have your own way to implement BOPS in your uh, class session. So finally, the concluding remarks would be 
that class sessions should be meticulously planned and properly executed. And engineering instructors should constantly focus on constructive alignment to maintain the OB perspective, obviously. And Bob's model can be used to effectively design class sessions. Based on my own personal experience, I'm a big proponent of Bob's model. So with this, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. You can ask your questions if you have any. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Professor Majoris Tham. Uh, for your BOPS model, which is a new one for Bangladesh and for other countries. So at the moment, I'd like to invite some questions from the participants. Uh, there are questions. I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. Well, no questions only to share the presentations to me. So, should we continue or to conclude the session? Because one, one, uh, Dr. El Sheikh has one question, I think. Dr. Sheikh, yes. Yeah, Salam alaikum. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I don't know if you can call this a question or just a feedback or comment or, of what you have shared. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, you referred to what uh, Prof. Felder has mentioned this morning, and you repeated that again that we should share in the class. Uh, what the student need to know rather than what is them, uh, nice to know for them. Uh, I, I just, from my experience, I, I just want to say that that's easier to say than to do. <laughs> Sometimes deciding, you know, which topic to, to, to keep and which topic to execute is not that straightforward. And normally for the design of the curriculum, yeah, we, do, we don't look only at one course, but it's a whole curriculum. And that course you are teaching most likely is a prerequisite to another course or maybe more than one course. And there are some requirements from the industry, from the accreditation, uh, from the, uh, uh, yeah, there are different requirements. Uh, and even the, 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 the the design of the course itself, sometimes when you remove one small topic, that will affect the, the, the whole, the whole uh, course uh, normally. So yeah, I, I agree, I agree with the concept, but my experience is that it's not, it's not that. Sometimes even our own uh, relationship with the course, sometimes there are topics that we love to teach, right? So we feel more comfortable to teach this, uh, this topic. So you feel very reluctant to remove this, this topic from the, from the, from the list. Uh, so yeah, this, this is my, my, my own experience about making a decision. It's not, it's not that easy to decide what to include and what to exclude from the course. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, responding to that. No, thank you. I mean, I understand that. Yeah, thank you very much for your comment. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's challenging. In this respect, I would like to highlight about something called threshold concept. Yeah, if you can identify the critical things or threshold concept related to that um, content which you will be teaching in this class session, then it helps. Then it helps. Frankly speaking, personally, it helped me. And I really, nowadays, I sometimes in the slides, I mean, I tell them right away that, yeah, these are included in the syllabus, but sometimes I give them as homeworks. Yeah, especially the low order things or memorizing things, I rather give them as homework than, I mean, spending valuable time in the class with those lower order things. Yeah, I, I, I have benefited from this suggestion a lot, but at the same time, I'm respecting your comment. Yeah, it's really, it's not, <clears throat> that easy as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, there is one sure. question from uh, Dr. Muhammad Abdullah Al Humayun. Would you please, I mean, I would request you to type your question um, in the Q&A section or in the chat box, then that will um, help you. Okay. And there is one uh, question from Sultan Nuruddin. Uh, please post schedules ahead, um, at least for today's afternoon and tomorrow. You will find it the, in the uh, symposium, uh, symposium website. The program schedule, the updated program schedule is already there, but I can upload that here as well. Uh, I'll try, I can try at least, but uh, you can find it from, um, from the website of the symposium, by the way. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Actually, you know, uh, in teaching arena, 
uh, to plan is to act, uh, you know, with a purpose to choose and choice with the essence of activity. So a teacher educator, he himself can produce uh, different models. He can produce some examples for better teaching. So what uh, the presentation Professor Islam delivered, that is really fantastic one on you know, the models of effective classroom sessions. And Dr. Islam, he himself uh, uh, prepared different uh, models, examples. And you know when we conducted training sessions in UGC, so uh, I found all the time he brings some new ideas for the trainees, for the trainers, as well as for the teachers. So I'd like to quote one uh, quotation from Maurice Ginsberg, who is a very famous educationist all over the world. He mentioned in his deliberation that teaching method uh, means an opt way of doing something as investigation or teaching with gravity, thoroughness, and surely as the results to be attained. So if you want to attain uh, the maximum benefits from the teaching or from the research. So we have to find out, we have to weigh out the new ideas. And for the reason, motivation is very important. So if our teachers, if our students are motivated, so they can learn, they can learn by doing, and good teaching or you know, good techniques really uh, important, very uh, pertinent, very important part in for teaching. So a good teacher teaches, a uh, better teacher uh, instructs, but the best teacher, best educator, educator, he can inspire or he can encourage his people, his students. So with the CYS, we'd like to conclude our uh, morning session. So with this presentation, session one ends over and we'll resume our uh, next session at 2 p.m. And this is the time for our Juhur prayer and for lunch. Thank you very much once again, all our valued, very dist distinguished uh, presenter, as well as participants from different parts of the world, especially from uh, uh, universities in Bangladesh and outside. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. Yeah. Back to you, uh, Dr. Sheikh. Yeah, if you can conclude. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Fahrul Islam. Yeah, uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Alaikum assalam warahmatullah wabarakatuh. So, uh, yeah, this is the end of. Uh, the first session. I'll see you next time and sure. stay blessed. Thanks. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Fokul. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So we meet again, inshallah, after 70 minutes. So we meet at uh, two o'clock Bangladesh time. That would be four o'clock uh, Kuala Lumpur time, inshallah. Thank you. I see you in uh, about yeah. seven. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Salaam alaikum.